keep uh, our next speaker is Nalis. He's a senior developer advocate at uh, Carsbase. He's going to talk to us about NoSQL. Hello, Dennis. How are Hi, you? Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. So, can you tell us a bit uh, what uh, the audience should uh, expect from this talk? Sure. So, well, um, I go to a lot of conferences and, and talk to a lot of developers, and I still think that for me, it feels like uh, the majority of developers uh, have limited experience with NoSQL in general, and they quite often don't understand the whole system or what's happened, what's happened in the past 10 years. And this talk is essentially uh, a conversation about, hey, uh, if you ever uh, meet me on a conference and you talk about ask about NoSQL, that's essentially what I would like to tell you about. So uh, 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 10,000 uh, 10, 10, feet overview of what's happening in the NoSQL, why we got where we are, and what are the faces, the, the problems that we have. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, yes, I know some developers uh, who locally are trying uh, NoSQL. Uh, I hope they are in the chat right now. So what we are going to do, <coughs> Dennis, you can start uh, your presentation and uh, whatever questions the audience might have, just type it in the chat box after the presentation. We are going to do a Q&A with Dennis. Is that good? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Awesome. So, <clears throat> Go, good luck, man. Bye. Yeah, thank you. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. I am Dennis. My name, is, uh, my name is Dennis. I work as a developer advocate at Couchbase. For those who never heard about Couchbase in the past, Couchbase is a NoSQL database, fairly similar with uh, MongoDB, but designed for uh, highly scalable applications in general. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I felt this need to talk about NoSQL in general, just n not about a specific technology. This is not the usual kind of talk that I give, but I I, I like to talk about uh, the ecosystem in general. And when I think about the uh, architecture of modern uh, CPUs, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing to realize that roughly 85% of the CPU is actually memory and 1% is dedicated to CPU. So <clears throat> this is a fairly old, uh, 12 years old uh, CPU. And you can see that everything that is, is inside the, the green lines are, are memory. And even when we go to a more, uh, more modern uh, architectures, so here is a, 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 a quad core array, it's pretty much the same. So the majority of the CPU is actually memory. And uh, why we have why we have such architecture? It is because uh, of one problem called latency. So, so latency is a, a big issue uh, in computer science in general. And, and as you can see, uh, the farther you get, uh, uh, the latency increases dramatically. The farther you get from from the CPU. Uh, and the problem with latency is that this is a very tough problem to solve. Quite often, uh, to have just milliseconds or nanosecond improvements, you have to come up with uh, new materials, new technologies, and invest potentially millions of dollars just to, to have a, a very small uh, increase in performance. <clears throat> so... One of the things we have been doing in the last, the thing that what we have been doing the last 20 years was essentially, uh, instead of improving latency, we start to increase the bandwidth. So we start to parallelize the stuff. So now we add more cores, uh, we add more parallel memory instead of just improving the performance of the memory itself. <clears throat> and if you, if you think about it, that's essentially uh, how we have. Uh, um, do, doing with apl application uh, with our applications in general. In general, we have uh, distributed databases. We have microservices. So we try to uh, distribute the the the, the application uh, in order to make this um, to, in order to input the throughput 
throughput of the uh, to improve the throughput of the application itself. And that's essentially one of the problems with NoSQL in, with SQL in general, relational database. So say we have you have two tables, right? User and role. Uh, if those two tables live in a single server, well, life is beautiful. When you are joining the the, the two tables, uh, it, it is in general super fast. So uh, it will, as long as your tables are properly indexed, it should each join should cost you around like just a few mi uh, milliseconds or m m microseconds, in fact. Uh, and then, but then, if you start when you need to scale out your database some problems start what to appear. So for instance, let's say uh, you add a second server and then the traditional way to, to solve this is to add a replication. Uh, so <clears throat> essentially you replicate, uh, uh, you always write to the server one and then you replicate and everything is replicated to server two. However, uh, this replication, if you make this replication synchronous, then you have to write to both servers uh, before you commit the transaction. Or if you make this uh, this replication uh, asynchronous, then you might end up with some dirt reads on server two. So let's say uh, you wrote you wrote to server one, but uh, you read nearly the same time the same uh, the same uh, column or the same line from the same row from the server two. So you might get some some dirt reads. Uh, and but then, if we try to make uh, instead of replicating, if we try if we try to make the relational truly distributed, then we end up with something called cross node join, right? Because when I'm writing a join, like I make a query and make a join there, I might end up uh, selecting stuff that part of the data is on server one, as part of the data is on server two, and because this is a cross node join. Uh, and the data has to travel over the network to make this join, it will take, um, <clears throat> your query will be super slow because of that. Again, another problem with latency. So uh, the question that I always uh, receive is, will, will my favorite relational database be distributed in the, in, in the future? And my answer is, hey, do you even want that? Because Relational databases, they are great for what they were designed for, to run in a single machine. Uh, at the moment that you make, try to force those relational databases to run distributed, you start to break the design. And then that's why uh, we, even though they are, most of them are uh, like 20, 30 years old, they still don't, don't run distributed. Uh, they barely want run, run distributed, to be honest. Uh, <clears throat> so that was a problem that uh, Google and and Amazon uh, re, uh, had roughly 20 years ago, and back then they were using Oracle, I think, and they were hitting some limits on Oracle as well. And one of the problems with Oracle and Teradata and some other uh, databases is that they uh, quite often they re, uh, they rely on sp uh, specialized hardware. And for Google, uh, Oracle wasn't uh, hitting the scale that they need, so they decided to say, hey, how can we create our own database that runs just on commodity hardware? And then, uh, a few years later, uh, both Amazon and Google uh, published two, two famous papers called uh, Dynamo, and Big, uh, Dynamo uh, from Amazon and Big Table from Google. And one interesting thing on the Dynamo paper, for instance, was that, hey, uh, instead of using tables, they decided to use a different data model. So uh, they decided to group the things. In this case here, I'm using uh, JSON as an example. So uh, because they organized the data differently, so instead of here, I would need at least three or four tables to store the same kind of data. And because I'm uh, storing data as JSON, in this case, I can save this in a single document. So what we re they realized uh, after uh, re-implementing this whole thing was that 70, roughly 70% 70 uh, of the operations were just by key values, uh, key, were key values uh, operations because you don't need any joins anymore. 
And then 20% of the operations were uh, returning a set of rows, and only 10% you actually need some kind of join. And well, that's really great because uh, when you uh, when you are doing that much joins, doesn't matter where your data lives in the cluster, so you can make a fully distributed database. <clears throat> When you change the data model, you also make your application less transactional. So, for instance, let's say I need to insert this uh, a user, right? In a relational database, I need to insert it uh, in the user table, insert the start the transaction, insert in the user table, ins ins insert it in the user roles, insert preference, and then commit a transaction. And of course, managing this transaction has a cost to the database. When I'm inserting like a different data uh, structure, like JSON again. Inserting the whole user is just a single operation, so I, I kind of don't need a transaction for that because it is already a our nothing uh, operation. Uh, I would just need transaction when I need to, let's say, I need to add two users at the same time, then the trans transaction. But uh, the the use cases for uh, this uh, for ins changing two documents at the same time is already like much smaller than just inserting uh, a single user or a shopping cart or, or those kind of things. So they were able uh, as well to reduce the, the need of transactions which uh, re remove a lot of overhead of the database. So essentially after those two papers, uh, we uh, had the, the big bang of NoSQL databases, pretty much all the NoSQL databases and always came after those two papers. <clears throat> and that's exactly, uh, uh, and, and then 10 years have passed, and that's exactly what I uh, would like to talk today. So what happened in the past 10 years? Um, so if we assume that everything, I, I am not a big fan of no, this NoSQL term because uh, it doesn't, it essentially defines everything that is not relational. So if we assume that NoSQL is everything that is not relational, we have over 200 NoSQL database out there, according to DB engines. But uh, relational is by far the most popular uh, type of database, which seems to me that uh, <clears throat> we are still overusing relational database in general. Uh, and then, of course, uh, followed by uh, document stores. So, uh, document store, document database like Couchbase and, and MongoDB, uh, they are the closest you can get from relational. So, they are uh, as well um, the second most popular type of database. Uh, one thing that is important to highlight for me in general is <clears throat> even though the original papers were talking about scalability, and to run distributed. Not all NoSQL databases will, will be distributed. Again, we are talking about everything that is not relational, and uh, this is a very big group, so you have all sorts of database there. And again, not a, a distributed database, if the database is, is distributed, that doesn't mean that the, it is highly scalable. So in some scenarios, the database uh, were originally designed to run up to 20 servers, let's say. For instance, <clears throat> let's say you have a mass, uh, the database has a master slave architecture. So MongoDB has this, this kind of architecture uh, where you your application always talk to a master and the master will talk to the slaves. One of the problems here is that when you have, when you need to get your data, you have just, uh, you need at least two hops, right? So your application talks to, to the master, the master talks to the slave. But the, on, the, on the flip side here, uh, there are a bunch of uh, features that are very easy to implement. So for instance, uh, if your, let's say your, your document has uh, five foreign keys and you want to check if those foreign keys exist or they are valid, the foreign keys, the master has the like the list of all the IDs in your database. So once you send a document to the master, he can quickly check uh, and validate if all those foreign keys uh, are valid. But the problem here, of course, is you have a single point of failure. So if the master dies, you have a, 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 your database will be unavailable for a, a certain period of time. And yes, of course, you can add more masters, but uh, it just become a little bit complex to manage that, and still the, the 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 master will always be a bottleneck.
So when you have a different kind of texture, architecture like uh, Couchbase and Cassandra, for instance, uh, where we have a masterless architecture, which means that there is no uh, <clears throat> uh, difference between nodes, and your application has to talk to all nodes. Essentially, uh, the, the application can guess where the data is by hashing the ID of the data. But in this case, you can scale to hundreds of nodes uh, without any major issues. So for, just to give a, an idea, uh, a rough idea. So in Couchbase, in theory, our limit is 1,024 uh, nodes. And, but roughly, I would say no client has reach any anywhere close to 200. So we do have uh, clusters with 100 nodes, but that's pretty much the, the max that we can get. Uh, th that clients uh, are, are willing to create. Uh, after that, they decide to uh, create a second cluster. Uh, but the problem with this architecture here is one, uh, okay, it's, it is more highly scalable, but one is more difficult to build a database like that because it is a truly distributed system. And second, uh, if if you want to store a, a new document and you have to validate your foreign keys, um, it will be a more cost expensive here because uh, you will send the data to one of the nodes of your cluster. And this node has to maybe make five requests asking other nodes if this uh, key really exists. So there are definitely some trade-offs according to the architecture uh, you choose. So for instance, MongoDB, uh, my experience, in my experience, the sweet spot is something around between like five or six nodes. Uh, after that, things get very much, a little bit complicated. While like Cassandra and, and Couchbase, I think that's far easier to, to have like 20, 13 or 15 nodes running. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of NoSQL nowadays as well is all the distributed NoSQLs, they can handle fa failure quite, quite well. So in general, uh, you might not even notice that the one node have, have failed because they usually have copies of the data or uh, just parts of the data uh, that uh, will be unavailable for a short, pe short period of time. So that's one of the advantages of NoSQL in general. They are already a database that were, were born, some, they were almost cloud native. So handling failure uh, in those databases are usually quite easy and it's not a big, big enough headache in general, like in the relational world. world. Uh, no sequels are so less bureaucratic um, nowadays. I, I personally believe that um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why, uh, why no sequel is less bureaucratic. So we have like flexible schemas. We kind of trust uh, whatever the, de the, the developer send us. Is because I think that when relational databases were created, the team responsible for managing the database and the, the, the team responsible for developing the application, there were different teams. So you need some sort of contract between the application and the database. And then you also need to revalidate everything. Uh, in the NoSQL world, we already assume that, okay, if your database is saying something wrong, that's a bug with your application. Uh, we don't want to uh, waste time revalidating everything is your responsibility is to send the right data for us. Uh, our responsibility on the SQL side is to re uh, write and read the data as fast as possible. So in general, they uh, have more, much more flexibility uh, in the schema and, and handling with data in general. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, as I mentioned, NoSQL, uh, this, this term NoSQL, um, or NewSQL, or NoSQL 2.0, kind of feels like some marketing guy is trying to define some new training terms in, in, our, uh, in, in technology. I prefer to call uh, databases for the real categories, for the real categories. In case you are not aware of some of them, uh, key value stores are essentially the, uh, big hash maps. So uh, you uh, insert data by the key, 
uh, using the key and you get data by the key. So DynamoDB and Redis are essentially uh, key value stores. You can also use Couchbase and I suppose MongoDB as key value stores as well, because to build a document database, you have to build a key value store first. Uh, document databases, essentially uh, you store data as JSON and you can still query and and create indexes and uh, pretty much everything that you do with relational, it is the closest you can get from relational. So again, MongoDB Couchbase fits here. Columnar storage, uh, Cassandra is uh, essentially when you need a more global overview of the data. So it's really good for when you need to group data, uh, group data and count and 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 aggregations in general. A graph database, we have uh, Nel4j and TigerGraph. Uh, we also had like Tinkerpop, which is a spec that uh, I suppose the Cosmos, Cosmos DB support Tinkerpop. And also uh, Giraf, which is um, not being used anymore that much. But essentially on the graph database, uh, you, you would use a graph database when the relationship between entities is more important than the entity itself. And we also have search engines, so Bleav, Elasticsearch, Solar. So you, you, you essentially need to, to do, use this kind of database when uh, you need to do some smart text matching. And time series, uh, like uh, InfluxDB, which is uh, when time plays a bigger uh, a big role in, in your data. So let's say you need to um, plot the graphs or analyze the graph of uh, the stock market prices. So time is very important here. And that's ex exactly when you should use uh, consider using a t time series database. <clears throat> One thing that I like to highlight here is that most of these data databases are more than seven years old. And this is really important because I do think that for databases in general, it takes a while for them to mature, and they are all um, mature uh, piece of softwares. I like to compare with database uh, with uh, aircraft engines. So aircraft engines also, even though you come you come up with the most magnificent magnificent uh, kind of engine, it will still take at least like seven, eight, ten years for this engine to be commercial available. And that's pretty much, I would say, with databases in general, they take a while to mature. And because they are, um, they have been out there for a while, pretty much uh, all the tools you need are already there. Uh, however, of course, uh, you won't be able to use your favorite tools uh, with essentially all the things, the tools you like to use with the relational, you won't be able to use use with NoSQL, but we have, uh, in general, similar tools that are good enough. Um, and this is still one thing that we have to improve in NoSQL, uh, which is uh, uh, have more integrations with uh, third-party tools. So here are the big guys, essentially. So the open source guys, those are the most famous databases out there. So MongoDB, Elastic, Cassandra, Couchbase, InfluxDB, Nel4j, and Redis. So if you are considering using uh, a NoSQL database, that's essentially one of the guys you should, one of the databases you should, should consider. And when we talk about cloud providers, then we have naturally DynamoDB, CosmosDB, and, and Firestore, uh, respectively from Amazon, Microsoft and, and, and Google. And this is essentially how uh, they are current. Uh, I'm referencing here first, the first rate. And this is essentially how they are distributed nowadays, which are the most popular uh, or how the, what are the current offerings of those databases. Cool. Uh, another important thing to highlight here is that every um, Pretty much every month we have new NoSQL databases out there. And quite often they mention, they mention something called storage engines. So storage engines are, uh, they are, very, are essentially um, early stage database. So it's pretty much like a framework that manages the files for you. So that's the storage engine, engine is responsible for writing the data to the disk. And in general, new databases will, instead of creating their own storage engine, they will use someone that is already 
uh, well established. So, for instance, um, CockroachDB uh, started with uh, RocksDB, which is this uh, blue one here. So they started using RocksDB, and then uh, in the first few versions, and then after a while, uh, I think last year, they moved to their own storage engine. So uh, pay attention to this, because whenever um, you probably won't, don't want to use uh a storage engine from from someone else, because um, you need to create a uh, quite often you need to create a, a specific storage engine for your use case. So whenever you see a database saying that hey we use uh, this storage engine or that storage engine and they were not the ones who created it, uh, potentially the database is sub optimized. Uh, in general, uh, I would say that starting with NoSQL is very easy uh, nowadays. So pretty much all cloud, uh, all database vendors have a very good documentation, and I would say you can roughly go from novice to to advanced in somewhere around six six hours. If you ha have already the right materials. Uh, you potentially only need like 40 hours or so. So that's very easy to start with. There's no need to be afraid. Be afraid. And but still, what we, what I learned over the years, and I think that the database community learned over the years was that developers were not afraid of using NoSQL database. What they were really afraid of is, is how do I maintain that? Like, what should I do? when something goes wrong. And and DynamoDB was the biggest example of that because uh, when uh, it is a, a NoSQL, so-called NoSQL database, but if you see the adoption of uh, DynamoDB was incredible because, hey, if I don't want to, uh, to, if I don't need to manage the database itself, it's not a big deal. I can use that, that kind of database. I have seen even people using uh, DynamoDB in, in the wrong scenarios just because uh, they didn't want to manage uh, the database by themselves. And all the NoSQL vendors kind of noticed this, this, uh, this trend. And I would say that pretty much all NoSQL providers now have their own cloud uh, offerings. So uh, Couchbase has one, Elastic, MongoDB, Datastax, uh, Neo4j, they all have the, their, their offer of database as a service. There's also another trending topic right now, which is running uh, databases on Kubernetes with operators, which will, which essentially helps you to achieve something similar to uh, a database as a service. And this is exactly my talk on Friday. So, guys, uh, if you or you if you will, if you had time, attend, uh, please watch this talk. It's called. Uh, database on Kubernetes, why you should care. It is essentially one of my favorite talks. Uh, and then we also need to talk a little bit about the problems with uh, NoSQL uh, currently. Uh, one of the main problems for me is that uh, the databases are converging in general. So uh, you see things like, okay, PostGres uh, now allows you to store uh, JSON Right, so there is a, a, a new query language. And then I have seen people on the conference say, hey, you don't need NoSQL anymore because uh, Postgres allows you to sort JSON. And well, no way. There is ages of difference of the support for JSON on, let's say, MongoDB in Couchbase versus the support of JSON on Postgres. Uh, or Couchbase, so like support transactions, MongoDB offers a standalone mode, even though it is designed to be a distributed database. DynamoDB is starting to add um, some small capabilities to query data. Uh, many other databases are also trying to be uh, uh, operational and anal analytics at the same time. So the main message here is when you are comparing NoSQL databases, if you are trying to uh, box, to do some box ticking, uh, you probably will have a bad time. So don't try to compare NoSQL databases by just checking, hey, do you have this? Check. Do you have this? Check. You, have, you really have to understand 
the use case, right? I usually, I well, in the past, I have heard a lot like something like, okay, do one thing and do that thing well. And I, I used to agree with that, but I don't think that the, the reality works that way. So for instance, let's say I have a database and I want to implement uh, uh, advanced search uh, for the back office just to search for users, right? Because quite often uh, you ask a name and then you don't know how to spell it properly. And then you want to be able to find uh, some uh, client or a user as fast as possible. And just because you want to do this kind of fuzz matchy, uh, fuzz match in general, uh, you have to, uh, let's say, install uh, Elasticsearch, configure the nodes, match this whole environment, synchronize the, uh, the data from your database to Elasticsearch just to make an advanced search on, on your backend for the back of, of your company. It's kind of a waste of resource because you don't mean, you don't need that much uh, you don't need all this power just to implement this specific use case. So it would be nice if um, the database, for instance, has a full text search in it, right? Then you can leverage the structure you are have in the database just to do this this uh, fuzz ma fuzz string matching. So and that's why databases are kind of realizing that and they are trying to have uh, off, uh, offer specific service with very limited use cases. And that's one thing that you should be aware of. So, okay, uh, that's nice that you offer this thing here, but how far can I go? So you really have to uh, spend some time um, understanding the database and, and the capabilities of each, each scenario. Um, one of the things that I also hear a lot is um, which which NoSQL database should I choose for this specific scenario? And then I start asking a lot of questions and quite often I hear from the developer, hey, I, I don't know the answer for this. And it, it's really important to understand your scenario before you, um, you uh, choose a database. So be, because there is this famous phrase from the Alice in Wonderland, which where the cat says, hey, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Which means that, hey, you, if you don't know what, what you're looking for, kind of doesn't matter, right? Whatever database you, uh, you choose will do the job. Uh, one of the questions that I ask is, hey, which kind of consistency you need? Do you need uh, a serializable uh, consistency or is read committed good enough? And again, mo I think the huge majority of developers have no idea of what I'm talking about. So for instance, Couchbase and MongoDB uh, also support a read committed uh, transactions which is, I would say, the new trend now in, in NoSQL databases is to support transactions they didn't have uh, in the past because it's much more complicated to uh, add transaction support for distributed databases. Uh, Couchbase has one approach, MongoDB has another. So this is uh, one of the hot topics in NoSQL today. And really committed is essentially the, the same, um, the default consistence, um, the default consistence model in most of the relational database as well. So if what you do uh, in, if you never change that, potentially that's the same thing you will get uh, on those non-SQL databases. And there are uh, many other questions that you should ask as well. So for instance, uh, how much, uh, how much uh, do I need to scale? So if I, my nodes will be, if I just need like four, six nodes, then I could pick this specific database. If I need to scale to 100 nodes, then I have to go to another database. Uh, how I will query this data, how fast the queries should be, because uh, naturally some database have some, uh, this has different SLAs. Um, how often do I update the data? So if I don't update the data that often, then I might use some, some database that is eventually consistent instead of using uh, one that is strong consistent and I get some other benefit from that. So there's a bunch of questions you should ask yourself 
uh, before choosing a NoSQL database because um, once you choose a NoSQL database, it's a little bit hard to move to another. It's not like relational that you can essentially, if you're using Hibernate or other ORM frameworks, you can just uh, change your string connection and boom, you are uh, running on another NoSQL or another relational database. Uh, a rule of thumb here is whenever you are uh, selecting uh, or choosing a, a NoSQL database, pay attention to the defaults because they will uh, give you a nice hint on how you should uh, use the database. Uh, a second problem that I kind of already talked about is uh, it's really hard to migrate from one NoSQL to another. Uh, quite often, you have to rewrite your whole persistence layer because they are not super compatible. And this is one of the issues that we are working on now. So um, Nel4j has uh, opened his language to be a, a open spec so everybody can implement the same. And white column uh, type of databases, we have something called SQL++, which is uh, um, uh, a paper published from a paper UAT, published CSD. So essentially, it's a language that is uh, fully compatible with SQL, but with some extra keywords to help you uh, use uh, query data when you have a hierarchical structure. Just to give an example, uh, I mean, Asterix to be Couchbase, Apache Duo, and PartQL already support SQL++. PartQL is an AWS uh, database. And it is very similar to, uh, to SQL in general. And if you're uh, familiar with JPQL, you'll be, you, you probably will understand well how it works. But essentially, you can navigate through the structure by just using dots. And the father of SQL itself is a big supporter of this language. So Don Chamberlain was one of the guys who created SQL. Um, and he actually wrote uh, a tutorial, uh, a book, a free book, actually, called SQL++, uh, plus for, SQL++ plus plus for SQL users. And that's one of the things that Couchbase and some other companies are trying to push now. Hey, let's create a, st standard, specific, a standard language for NoSQL databases. Uh, I am... Uh, the last thing I would like to talk about is uh, open source versus enterprise. So it is a very, um, it is a problem that we still need to figure out how to handle. Because if you think about database in general, we I, I understand that we all would love to uh, have to have all databases to be open source. But the problem is when you see the the this, the amount of contribution that the community um, make to those databases, they are essentially minimal. So the the majority of the, of the contribution comes from the the, the, the company making the uh, the developing the enterprise version of the database, and this is uh, kind of. Um, one of the issues we have right now, because okay, we are saying open source, but there's no next to no contrib uh, uh, community contribution contributions on those projects apart from Postgres, I would say. Pretty much, no, uh, the other database have next to no community contributions at all, and this is something that we should expect already because databases are very complex piece of software. So uh, potentially, once you get into database, you, you you potentially spend your whole career there because they're very complex. There is a lot of theories, a lot of things you should know before even changing a, a single a line of code. Um, and that's essentially one of the problems we have. So uh, last year, MongoDB changed their license to uh, they, they created their own uh, license, Redis went the same way, uh, Couchbase and a few others decided to stay uh, with uh, using the, the old ones. And the problem with those two, this new type of licenses is that they add a lot of loopholes there. And one of the main motivations of this, uh, why they changed their license was because uh, some cloud providers that you probably are aware of, they decide to offer... Um, 
manage a service of those databases without contributing to the database itself. So they just grab the, the database and run on a managed service, and that's it. And this uh, and this kind of impact impacted the 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 revenue of those companies, and that's one of the reasons why they decided to change the license model. Uh, but so far, uh, this is um, licensing is um, one thing that we discuss. I would say every week on Catchbase and and some other and pretty much whenever I have a chance, I still discuss this with other uh, folks in the field, in, in, in working in other companies. But and so far, things like uh, we are uh, the consensus is to create to have a single core. Uh, a single core business model. So essentially, hey, the core for the enterprise and the the and the commute versions or the free versions are essentially the same. But on the enterprise versions, you have uh, some um, some extra features. So Couchbase is kind of walking this direction. We are not there yet. So we still have uh, different cores for community enterprise, but. Uh, we are already changing the the whole uh, the the code internally to move to this to to this um, to this kind of business model, and there are some other uh, companies that are already there. So Elastic uh, already have like this single core model, and well, I hope that we we should go to the same direction instead of creating um, specific. Uh, license models, which is uh, terrible for the open source community in general. Uh, a brief recap here. So I do think that relational databases are still overused. Uh, NoSQL is getting very easy uh, to start with. And now we have uh, pretty much all databases have database, pretty much all vendors have a database as a service offer. Um, choosing NoSQL is still uh, will still require a lot of investigation. So whenever before um, before go choosing a NoSQL, make sure you um, spend enough time investigating and understanding how uh, everything works under the hood and what are the best use cases for each one. Because migrating for, uh, from one NoSQL to another will potentially uh, force you to rewrite your whole persistence layer. Um, so yeah, that's some of the things uh, that you should be bearing in mind right now. That's essentially what I have. Uh, I just would like to uh, talk about uh, Nibit. So they are uh, sponsors of the event and also Couchbase partners. So if you need some help with NoSQL, uh, probably you should sh uh, sh uh, check out those guys. And yeah. Uh, that is what I have. I am a little bit, yeah, I'm just on time. And if I have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's okay, see so if let's we have any questions, have any in, the questions in the chat here. Okay, so we okay, have, so, um, we have um, so Firestore. So Firestore uh, well, I'm not oh, super I'm not familiar super with Firestore, with Firestore, Firestore to be Store. honest. Um, um, so I don't have, so I don't have a, a, a strong opinion, strong opinion on it. On what it. I know, what uh, I know uh, is that they is are? That, it is becoming, it is the, becoming the, main, the main one of the main OSQL database on, 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 on Google Cloud. Google Cloud. And, and what I know about Forrester is, is that they are, that they are in, some extent, in some extent, our, our uh, competitors, competitors because Couchbase also Couchbase has, also has uh, a, mobile a mobile database called Couchbase Lite, which automatically synchronizes with uh, with a backend uh, database. So when you have a mobile application, for instance. And instead of making a, a lot of REST calls to your uh, backend application, we can synchronize. Uh, if you use Couchbase Lite and you're using Couchbase, we um, we take care of the synchronization for you, which is makes uh, really great for databases uh, when you need to make applications that are offline first. So, for instance, um, there are a lot of games that are using Couchbase Lite and and uh, flight companies because, of course, when you're traveling. Uh, most of the uh, apps, uh, you don't have connectivity, so it's really good for those specific use cases when you are um, when you need to be offline first. And it's also a free database. Great. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Dennis, for 
the dog. I have a few questions from my end as well. I would like to ask, uh, when do you use uh, a new SQL database instead of an, uh, a relational one? In one, in what context? Okay, so I didn't want to uh, touch this topic and during the talk because it's a, f a very extensive. In general, okay. I would say um, one is scalability. So if your data grow, if you expect that the data will uh, grow um, really fast. So for instance, let's say in a year, I know that a database, a relational database, won't be good enough. That's when you should potentially consider NoSQL databases because they are uh, the majority of them are highly scalable. Um, what else? And of course, when you have specific specific scenarios. So for uh, let's say um, for um, full text search or for um, uh, time series data or columnar storage, so you're just doing, you need a data lake, for instance, then you go to a, to a NoSQL no database. But quite, I think uh, the main uh, thing when you should consider database is scalability. So for instance, um, at Couchbase, uh, we, this uh, company that has this, has as a CEO uh, bitten f fruit, they are heavy users, uh, I can't say the name, but uh, most of the products are white, uh, and they are have users of Couchbase. And whenever uh, uh, you log in into any of the uh, of the prod of their prod the products, you're essentially uh, the data is stored in Couchbase. And you have and in this in their case, they have like more than a billion devices. So you can imagine that you, you can you can simply use a relational database for that. And that's one of the user cases uh, when you should you should consider uh, NoSQL, uh, and as well when you need like let's say you need to read from the database as fast as possible. So a lot of betting companies also uh, rely on on NoSQL in general because um, NoSQL in general won't have a lot of overhead that relational database have. Okay. Okay. Understood. There. So if uh, my database is going to explode in uh, size. Uh, that expected size in a year, then we have to try new SQL. Uh, also, I want to talk a bit about uh, CloudDB for the students here, for the developers here. Does CloudDB offer any? Uh, does CloudDB offer any cloud offerings? So good question. So um, CloudDB and Couchbase, they are actually different things. They were born. Uh, uh, in fact, Couchbase. Were bo uh, was born uh, from CouchDB. So two companies, uh, so uh, one of the companies responsible for CouchDB joined with one of the companies re responsible for Memcached, and they create this new company couch, uh, called Couchbase. I would say the couch, CouchDB uh, nowadays, they barely have, uh, they don't have a lot of traction anymore. So Couchbase really, uh, um, have improved a lot, and then CouchB kind of is, I would say, falling behind. Couchbase, yes, we do have a database service uh, solution already. Uh, but um, one thing that uh, I would like to invite you guys is to join on my talk on Friday, where I will show you how can you deploy a database as a service in your own Kubernetes cluster. So, you, I mean, okay, you can hire database as a service, but you can also have this on deploy uh, on your own cluster and then fail nodes and scale up and scale down without any uh, human interaction. So um, that's um, pretty much, I mean, pretty much all the database as a service uh, solutions out there are under the hood using Kubernetes and operators, which is essentially the talk that I'm going to, um, oh, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about. But yes, uh, long long story uh, long long story short, Couchbase also has uh, uh, the best uh, the business service solution now. Oh, awesome, awesome. So, uh, like Denis says, everybody on Friday, Denis has a, a slot on databases on Kubernetes and uh, why you should care. It's at uh, 1 a.m. Uh, motion time. Okay, so do we have any questions? Uh, 
no, no question so far. Okay. Uh, so on Friday, Dennis, are you going to explain us a bit on the uh, on some uh, scenarios where a developer might uh, use uh, NoSQL and Couchbase, right? Uh, I might, uh, I can uh, talk a little bit about that, but uh, my talk there is essentially, hey, I will deploy a database on Kubernetes and then I will fail the nodes, I will scale up and scale down and try to mess up with the database and I will show you guys how, okay, the database will automatically recover because uh, of the whole infrastructure of operators and Kubernetes. And, and the whole topic is that Essentially, in the near future, uh, you 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 will choose between um, running a database on Kubernetes or uh, or using a, a database as a service because they are they will be they will be very similar in general. So all the benefits of um, that you have on the on database as a service, you also have on Kubernetes, but with much more uh, flexibility because you can configure the database whatever the you can. Um, fine tune the database while in most cloud providers the way you can fine tune in the database is very limited so you can just let's say improve the number of reads and writes for instance okay, okay good uh, if anybody have any question on uh, or wants a full demo on couch base a guy from uh, uh, a guy called uh, Stephen Bird uh, told us uh, to contact uh, Nasdit for that Great. So I think uh, we are out of time. Thank you very much, Denis, for the presentation. It was great. And see you on Friday. I will okay, be see you guys. There too. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.